Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Oftentimes on this channel, we criticize the leadership of the Jedi Commanders within the JR and more or less leave it at that. Today, I thought it'd be a good idea to give a little bit more constructive criticism on how they can do better. In Star Wars, because of the technology available, the battlefield oftentimes starts in space and eventually winds up in the atmosphere and eventually planet side. Planetary invasions were the most complex operations that the Grand Army of the Republic had to take on during the Clone Wars, and so today we're going to look at the three stages of a planetary invasion, that's the space battle, the air battle, and the land battle, and look at what the Jedi have gotten right and what they've gotten wrong and what they really should do in the future to make sure their missions are more successful. As long as you have control of the orbit and space around a planet, you have control of the planet. It's a simple matter of gravity and high ground real estate. From space, you always have a clear line of sight on enemy forces, and you can easily observe enemy activity. Oh, it's beautiful. And if you can successfully blockade an enemy planet and the enemy relies on imports from other worlds for survival, you can starve them into submission. This is a common tactic used by the Separatist Navy. They did this during the Battle of Ryloth. Most worlds are defended by either orbital platforms or defensive fleets, or sometimes even both. This means conventional ship versus ship battles are still quite important in this era of Star Wars. As a Republic Naval Commander, it's important to know the strengths and weaknesses of your own ships alongside the strengths and weaknesses of your enemy's vessels. For the most part, the Separatist Navy is comprised of upgraded freighters and cargo ships that aren't necessarily purpose-built for warfare. Most of these ships, like the Munificent Class Star Frigate or the Lucre Hulk's battleship, have massive interior compartments designed for hauling goods, or in this case, battle droids and munitions. Because the Separatists mainly rely on mechanical crews, most Separatist ships don't even have life support in all of the compartments of their ships. This means a lot less energy uses and a lot less vulnerability. And so many layers of bulkhead on this Separatist ship are just extra layers of armor, which are designed to absorb turbo laser fire. This is why precision targeting of crucial areas on Sepi ships like the bridge, engines, and reactor is very important for a Republic victory. The Separatists also like to heavily arm their frigates and battleships with line-of-sight turbo laser weapons for broadside exchanges. They also had some pretty advanced missile technology rounding out their arsenal. The majority of the fighters used by the Separatists were droid fighters. These starships usually were battery powered and had very short range, but at the same time they were far smaller than their Republic counterparts and therefore much more maneuverable in a dogfight. With all these factors taken into account, the Separatist Navy is most deadly at close to mid-ranges. The Separatist droid fighters are capable of swarming capital ship defenses and the offensive firepower on their ships is no joke. For the Republic Navy, the most important ship was the Venator-class Star Destroyer. This is more of a hybrid carrier battleship. While it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Separatist Frigate in a broadside exchange, this is not a viable long-term strategy. The Venators were full of clone troopers and all of the war material they need to carry out a full-on land invasion. The ship wasn't especially robust and instead depended heavily on its large complement of starfighters. A single Venator could hold several hundred fighters and gunships. Many of the fighters were even hyperspace equipped, giving the Republic fleet the advantage in long-range battles. We see during the Battle of Ryloth when Republic forces approached the Separatist blockade, Republic forces first deployed a screen of V-19 torn starfighters to probe the enemy defenses. Separatist leader Captain Took has the Republic forces outnumbered, and so when the V-19s come within firing range, the Separatist leader brings in additional reinforcements and starts deploying his own fighters. The V-19s were excellent light interceptors. They were very commonly used at the beginning of the war, but since they lacked hyperdrives along with shielding and heavy weapons, they weren't exactly the best long-range attack ships. Sogatano, who is leading this wing of fighters, refuses to obey a direct order from Admiral Wolf Yolaren to pull back and defend the Republic fleet. Short-range interceptors like the V-19 are specifically designed to intercept incoming enemy fighters. But unfortunately, because of Commander Tano's delay, her entire wing is taken out by the Separatists and the Republic fleet is left vulnerable to droid counterattacks. It's not a bad idea to use a small flight of V-19s to scope out enemy forces and see what you're up against, but to do real damage, you really need attack starfighters. This is where the Y-Wing comes in. Each one of these ships is armed to the teeth with a variety of proton torpedoes and bombs. It just takes one of these ships to slip through the enemy defenses to do massive amounts of damage to an enemy fleet. 
During the operation to take down the malevolence, a flight of Y-Wings were able to disable the giant ship's main ion cannons with just a handful of proton torpedoes, something an entire fleet of Venator-class Star Destroyers couldn't do. Keep your short-range interceptors at home to defend your Venator-class Star Destroyers and Acclimator-class Assault Ships. Although they have point defense weapons, usually when these are engaged, it's already really too late to prevent your ships from getting damaged. A cautious strategy is necessary, especially in the earlier years of the war. Not only are your Venator-class Star Destroyers and Acclimator-class Assault Ships jam-packed with clones and war material, the enemy also has you greatly outnumbered in every sector. Since the Grand Army of the Republic is fighting in a civil war, there are plenty of incentives to not just glass a planet from orbit. And so usually an infantry force is deployed to the ground to physically take control of territory. Generally speaking, you're going to want control of the space around a planet and also the atmosphere if you want to get boots onto the ground. But sometimes the situation calls for a combat insertion while fleets are still battling overhead. We see the Republic do this numerous times, like during the Battle of Scipio and the Battle of Selicamai. The quickest and safest way to insert your forces would be to use larger ships like a Venator-class Star Destroyer or Acclimator-class Assault Ship to directly land onto the ground. But of course, if there are separatist anti-aircraft emplacements, these large ships can be quite vulnerable while in atmosphere. Although the Acclimator and the Venator are both rated for atmospheric flight, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're maneuverable at all in these situations. A huge amount of energy is dedicated to the repulsor lifts that keep these gigantic vessels afloat when they're in atmosphere in a planet's gravity well. The deflector shields therefore are significantly weaker during these types of maneuvers. All it takes is one direct hit on a repulsor and these cumbersome vessels will come crashing to the ground. There's very little room and time for recovery. And that would be a huge, unacceptable loss of manpower and resources. The Acclimator class assault ship holds around 16,000 troopers. During the Battle of Ryloth, an Acclimator is shot down by an anti-aircraft cannon, effectively destroying a third of Republic invasion forces. I would argue that these capital ships need to be protected, and you really shouldn't be moving them into atmosphere until all enemy uh, anti-aircraft emplacements are destroyed. Republic capital ships also have most of their turbo lasers placed topside, and so when a ship is moving into the atmosphere, they can't really exchange fire with forces on the ground. When in low orbit, however, a Republic ship can be still used for orbital bombardment, which can effectively take out ground emplacements with very little danger of return fire reaching them. Of course, you'll still need recon ships in atmosphere scouting the ground looking for those emplacements, which can be well hidden. The best way to do this is by using assault fighters like the Y-Wing or ARC-170, which can actually engage any enemy position that they find, along with ground teams of LAATs that can target some of the more hardened enemy positions. A Venator-class Star Destroyer can deploy up to 40 gunships, and each one of those gunships can carry around 30 guys or an entire platoon. These gunships are small enough to avoid ground fire and usually are escorted by Republic starships if any enemy fighters approach them. During the Second Battle of Geonosis, Republic forces encountered extremely heavy resistance from SEPI anti-aircraft fire, but still the majority of the LAATs made it to the ground, delivering important reinforcements and vehicles that helped the Republic establish a secure position on the planet. The Venator-class Star Destroyer can maintain its position in low orbit and become a perfect place to launch sorties to basically maintain air superiority. Separatist droid fighters need very limited infrastructure to remain operational and could still be a threat long after enemy AA emplacements are destroyed, and so you will need ground forces to eventually find those places. If you can dominate the space and the air over a planet, then the battle is pretty much almost over. The clone troopers you ferried on gunships to the surface are generally considered light infantry. They have the weapons and tools to help them establish an airhead on an enemy planet after taking out enemy AA positions. They might even have a few ATTEs and heavy weapons supporting them. But just like the Allied forces during Market Garden during World War II or the clones during the Second Battle of Geonosis, these light troops are going to be scattered over a large area and won't be able to hold out long against an entrenched enemy and their counterattacks. They'll need to condense their positions, wait for reinforcements so that a larger launchment can be created so that some depth could be added to the front lines. By securing the air over a planet, the larger Republic carriers can land and start disgorging large amounts of troops and armor and fire support. The Venator-class Star Destroyers even have prefabricated bases, which can be set up relatively quickly. 
The idea here is to pour enough Duracrete and bring enough clone troopers to the ground to make your presence feel more permanent. The clone trooper is far better trained and much more independent than your average Separatist droid. They're also a lot more expensive to train and therefore much more valuable. High casualty numbers cannot be replaced and therefore are unacceptable. With control of the air and space over a planet, you can expect the Republican Navy to increase their offensive pressure on enemy forces. By this point, you should have a decent amount of mechanized units on the ground, which can be supported by air controllers and forward observers that can direct fire support. Send these units to make contact with enemy positions and use your superior firepower to beat them into submission. The Jedi often make the mistake of being overly aggressive and asking their clones to do too much during this phase of battle. If you have access to capital ships overhead, there's really no reason to ever have to engage enemy forces in extremely close quarter battles. This happens way too frequently in the Clone Wars, and it wastes a lot of clone troopers. If the Separatist military forces were made up of sentient beings, you would expect probably a quick ceasefire and surrender the moment the Republic has air superiority and orbital superiority. But because the Seppies use expendable battle droids, it's not uncommon for Separatist commanders to keep their units fighting until they too are captured or killed. So one of your biggest goals here is to find the Separatist commander and basically capture or kill them, which will most likely end all operations on the planet. Because ultimately there's no point in negotiating with a clanker. So those are the three stages of a planetary invasion. As you can tell, most of my advice is just reminding the Jedi to be cautious and take into account the strategic and tactical advantages that they might have. Too often, the Jedi just rush headfirst into battle without any regard of the safety of the troopers underneath their command, and I think that is a big problem. Anyway, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.